And so last Sunday, if you missed it, last Sunday, we began our ascent. We began our ascent to the mountaintop of Romans chapter 8. This is, this is not only the high point of Paul's letter to the Romans. As, as I said last week, it's really the high point of the gospel. In many ways, it's the high point of Paul's theology or else the entire New Testament. Last week, we saw the law is coming together with the spirit in maybe unexpected ways. The law of the spirit of life, Paul says in verse 2, has set you free in Christ Jesus. This is the beginning of the gospel proclamation in this chapter. God has done it in many different ways. He says this over and over again. God has done it. Receive it. Receive it with open hands. And so I said last week that these next two weeks will unpack that a little bit more, the implications of what God has done by the Spirit in this new covenant, in this new promised fulfilled age in Christ. So look with me at verse 14 as we begin to make our turn towards the text. Verse 14 says this, for all who are led, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. Now this is familiar language to us, but I want to pause for just a moment and unpack that just a little bit before we move on. Everything is coming together in Romans chapter 8. Not only as the high point of the letter, as I said, but right here, there's a whole lot of biblical fulfillment that is packed into this one short verse. If you go back to Romans chapter 1 and verse 2 at the very beginning, all of the holy scriptures and really all of creation is crying out or else coming together in Christ. This is how Paul begins this letter. And in verse 4 of chapter 1, Christ is the... Paul says he's the son of God. And this is being revealed from the very first chapter by the spirit or the spirit of holiness, the spirit of the living Christ. So this sonship language, it begins right at the very beginning. And what what, what should we hear when we hear son of God language? Well, firstly and primarily, we should hear that son, this sonship language is messianic hope. So when I say messianic or I say Messiah or you hear Jesus Christ, this is messianic language. It's not primarily at the first. It's not God language. So when we say Christ or else Messiah, this is the Greek translation of this word from the Old Testament. When we're talking about that hope, we're talking about the king, the king in the line of David. And this goes all the way back to chapter one. And verse 3, Jesus is the long-awaited king in the line of David. So sonship language at first, when we hear, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, we are being invited into this royal family. That's the first thing we should hear. But there's other things coming together. And like, like I said last week, there's so many things coming together, it's easy to get confused. But there's, there's the theme of sons of God being angelic beings. So there's, a, there's a, a hint of the divine counsel or else divinity in this phrase. Sometimes sons of God refers to individual Israelites in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And sometimes, if you're not confused yet, sometimes sons of God or else the son of God refers to all the people of Israel together. And all of this is being summed up in God's Son, Jesus Christ, right here. So this is a loaded phrase, and I wish we could unpack that more, but we're not going to. So, so, Romans chapter 8, not only is God's law being fulfilled in us by the Spirit, which we saw last week, sonship, being adopted into the king's household, sonship is ours by the Spirit of God. Why sons? Why sonship? Look at verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. You're invited in. You're invited in by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the shift last week was unexpected, 
the law of God is not supplanted or else it's not replaced in this text. Although Paul puts the law against the gospel or the law in conversation with the gospel in other places, last Sunday we saw that the law is not, is not the, the gospel is not taking place uh, in contrast to the law, but it's the law and the law of the spirit of life. It was unexpected. And this week, there is an, another unexpected shift. And that's what we're going to focus on mostly here this morning. What John Chrysostom calls a downright perplexing shift. Downright perplexing. And I had no idea, and I still in some ways am trying to unpack what he even meant by that. Because so much of Romans 8 is familiar to me and it feels very common. This language, all this language feels common to me. But I'm trying to unpack what Chrysostom is noting is a perplexing shift in this text. You did not receive the spirit of slavery. You did not receive the spirit of slavery. And this goes back to Romans chapter 7, which is the law in Paul's body that wages a war against the law of his mind. So the law at work in his members, this, this slavery spirit that makes him powerless, the spirit of slavery... Paul doesn't go, as we might expect, from the spirit of slavery to the spirit of freedom. That's, that's the contrast that we might expect. And he does this in, in 1 and 2 Corinthians and other places. He goes from, from slavery to freedom. So that is a move that he does make and could make, but he doesn't here. No, Paul says, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. So it's a shift from captivity language, not to freedom, but to family language. That's a, that's, a, that's a surprising contrast. And so the church fathers among modern commentators explain this in a lot of different ways. And I'm just going to use an image or else two images that kind of help me or else betray the way that I want to make the move to interpret this text this morning. So Paul invites us to consider two different kinds of households, all right? So I'm going to outline one household, which is a slavery household, and the other, which is a family, a familial household. So what do I mean by that? Imagine a home that is governed by a master and slave economy. You guys know this household probably pretty well. He doesn't have in mind, Paul doesn't have in mind a godly lord and a servant, which this language can imply that, but a master and enslaved economy because he says this home is governed by fear, by fear. So it's not lord servant. There's a way in which we talk about master and slave and it's virtuous and it's good, but that's not what he has in mind here. It's master and slave and fear, the fear of punishment or the fear of authority or the fear of judgment. So Here's where I go in my head. Imagine a toddler. Do you feel like a toddler sometimes? Some of you are a toddler. That's good. Imagine a toddler who stays or else only stays in a certain space when mom or dad is present because if they leave that space, they're going to get their butt whooped. Right? That's, a, that's one way of talking about a fear economy, right? So... There, this is, uh, I'm highlighting a lot of patristic interpretation with one little image, um, and it's, it's maybe a developmental image, and I don't think that's primarily what's going on here in that text, but when, you, when kids are young, they don't understand reason, so sometimes you got to spank their bottom so they obey, right? But imagine living in that household economy for the rest of your life. The only time they ever obey is because of fear of punishment. Or, and maybe this hits you a little bit different way. We've been traveling a lot, so traveling analogies go into my head or images. Imagine never driving more than four miles per hour over the speed limit because you drive in a constant state of fear of the police punishing you. That's me. That's how I drive. I, I'm, I set my cruise at four over because I'm terrified, and even when I, when I drive by a police officer, which happened this week, it happened this week, and I'm going four over, I, I slow way down. It's ridiculous. I know. I know it's ridiculous. Um, and then 
occasionally, like it happened on Thursday, and this is maybe why it's triggered in my soul, they flip their lights on and they turn around and they go right past you just because they wanted to make a U-turn in the road. All right, so that's a slave economy, right? Master, slave, fear of punishment is the thing that motivates. It motivates obedience, but when the master's not around, there's no obedience. So that's the first image. This is living in slavery, the spirit of slavery. But Paul invites us to consider another kind of household in this text. Not a master and slave economy, but a home that is governed by a loving father with his sons, or else his entire household, sons and daughters. So imagine a child who grows up out of that that infant or else toddler phase, and they learn to stay in a certain space, not because mom or dad is present and they fear punishment. Not, Not that reason. But even when mom or dad is away, the son obeys the words of their father because they love their father. Wow, wouldn't that be great, right? That's the aim, that's the goal in parenting in so many different ways. Not a slave home to a free home. So it's, this is not the contrast Paul is making. It's not slavery to unrestrained freedom, but into a father's home, into a place governed by love and reverence, of obedience, not because of fear, but because of a depth of love that inspires joyful work in the home. Or to maybe go back to the traveling analogy, imagine that you're riding in a car with someone that you really trust. Now, if you're like me, if you're like me, even then I'm nervous. It's all cops all the time. So then imagine you're riding in a plane, riding in a plane where there is no sky police. There's no people checking their speed limits. And if they're taking off late, they can actually speed up in the sky. I don't know why they don't do that all the time, but they can can make up time. You hear the pilots say this. Uh, There is no sky police. And so when we get on that plane, we trust that the pilot is going to get us to the destination. And we're not living in this constant state of fear. This is where I imagine living in the state of a father who not only sets the rules, but he flies by the rules. This is the household That I imagine. So, we have received the spirit of adoption as sons, and this is unexpected. The spirit tells us deeply within us, Paul says, the spirit bears witness to our spirits that we are children, that we're children because of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We are made heirs, sons of God. Because we are now in him, adopted as sons to the Father. But there's more, and I hinted at it just now. Only, it's not that we are just simply children in the household. Verse 17, the first part of verse 17. And if we are children, if we're adopted into this new kind of household, out of of this slave economy and into the economy of the Father, the love of the Father, then we're not only just children, We are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. And the the language is is repetitious. It's very repetitious in the English, and it's more clear in the Greek. He says heirs, heirs, and again I say heirs, okay? So it's it's kind of awkward even. It's, It's hard to translate, and this is a good translation. So it's not simply that we become someone within the father's household, like a a hired servant. You guys can think about the the parable of the prodigal son and being, I I would love to come back into my father's house even as a hired servant. So it's not simply that we're coming into the home, not just as a child. Our inheritance is now the inheritance of the firstborn son. In Christ, Christ, We are all fellow heirs. We're heirs, heirs, fellow heirs with him. So this is boys and girls. You receive this inheritance. Male and female, slave and free, the firstborn and the lastborn. This is new covenant fulfillment. This is a a drastic shift. The new covenant in Christ's blood, the spirit of God speaks this, Paul says, 
to us and in us and in us. He says, you are mine. You are mine. You're my child. Don't live in fear. Everything more than that. You're not only my child. Everything is yours. I give it all to you. So live and work and obey and love in my house, not because you're afraid, not because you fear punishment or else condemnation. Condemnation is fully and finally done away with. That's how this chapter begins. There is no condemnation in my son. This is our inheritance. So live and work and love because you are my child. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Graciously give us all things in his son. This is the inheritance. God the Father sent his son. And don't let this familiar language be lost on you. This is radical. This is world-changing covenant language. Hear this. God the Father sent his only Son, and God the Son gave himself up for us. For us, and God the Spirit himself bears witness in us that this is our inheritance, what he accomplished. This All is yours. You are mine. You are adopted And I graciously give you all things, all things as my fellow heir. So this is, this is what the Spirit himself says to us. This is what he says even in us. How are we to respond? How are we to respond to this proclamation of the Spirit within and without The Spirit not only speaks to us and in us in this text, He speaks through us. He gives us the language to respond. We are invited to respond in the Spirit, by the Spirit. What do God's adopted children say? Look with me at verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom? By whom, the spirit of adoption, by him, we cry, Abba, Father. By him, we cry, Abba, Father. This is, this is our response in the household. The affectionate cry of the new covenant. Paul will say in his letter to the Galatians, because you are sons, because you are sons, and you're no longer fearful slaves, you're you're not unattached, so it's not like you're in slavery and now you're, you're free to do whatever you want. You're not unattached, but you're no longer fearful slaves. Now you are sons, and God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts so that we can cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit speaks to us and in us, and now by the spirit we respond Why the exclamation marks? Why the exclamation marks in Romans chapter 8? This is not, this is not a tender cry with daddy. Dads, hopefully you have spaces in your home where you can invite children up into your lap and they can cry because of a a boo-boo or whatever, right? And you could be tender and they could just quietly cry out to dad. That's not the language here. It's strong language. It's, it's like your kid yelling at you. Does that happen to you? Does that happen multiple days a week to you? This is strong language. This is strong language. They cry out to Abba, Father. It's a loud shout. And this recalls Mark chapter 14. Hear this. Mark chapter 14 and verse 36. And Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. This is the prayer of Jesus. This is the prayer of Jesus, the Son of God in Gethsemane. I think many of us are familiar with that. Jesus, the text says in Mark 14, is greatly distressed and troubled. 
His soul is very sorrowful even to death, the gospel writer says. And as Jesus approached the cross, he's making preparations to be betrayed and arrested and approach the cross, abandoned by his weak and tired disciples with his betrayer at hand, quietly Jesus prays. He said it's quietly, but it's 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 not calmly. It's not a state of tranquility, but he quietly cries out to his father in the night, Abba, Abba, Father. And Paul is saying that in Christ, now in the Son of God, we have received the spirit of adoption as sons, not only sonship, but also the inheritance of the firstborn. And he adds this, provided, provided we suffer with him, Verse 17, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So why do we cry out, Abba, Father? Or else what do we say by the Spirit? And why do we say, Abba, Father? Because this is the way of Jesus. This is the way of the household of the good Father. Greatly distressed And troubled in the face of betrayal and trials and death, Jesus prayed, Abba, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And with him, and with him adopted into this secure, loving household, we can cry out, Abba. We can say it quietly, but we can also shout it at our Father. The spirit of adoption has made us God's children and fellow heirs, and he has led us out of the household of slavery, out of a way of being in the world that relates to God in fear. And this is our default disposition, to relate in performance or else fear of punishment, out of fear, and not into licentiousness, and not into freedom to do what what we want, but into a family, a family of rules. The spirit, the law of the spirit governs and rules in this loving family. And in God's home, this is the liturgy. This is what we are invited to say, Abba. And and even Abba, Father, I'm terrified to shout that at the Lord. Abba, Father, because this life is filled with suffering and pain. Scott Hahn, one of my favorite theologians, puts it like this. Christians are conformed, and this is the pattern of the gospel. Christians are conformed to the image of Christ crucified first. Christ crucified, and then we can hope to bear the image of Christ risen again. So we are out of the slavery into the family of God, but this family is filled with suffering and pain, and heartache, and tribulation, and trial. Look at verse 18, our reading this morning. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And so Paul uses theological but very imaginative poetic imagery and language to describe the real life in the household of God, our present experience. So we're turning from this age of slavery, this age of powerlessness into the age of power by the Spirit. But what does that look like according to the Apostle Paul? The new age of the Spirit, the new covenant in Christ's blood, the age of adoption as sons, as fellow heirs, the age of the law of the Spirit of life breaking in, even now, with all of this present, already fulfilled redemption, which is already accomplished in Christ, 
All of that, all of the radical promises that were accomplished at the cross and are made manifest in our lives right now, all of that, it still doesn't feel complete. Amen? Amen? It doesn't feel complete. Everywhere we look, Paul says, we see not only people crying out, not only my heart and my soul at war within me, but the whole creation, everything outside me, it groans. Whether that's nature or my marriage or weather or governments or viruses or animals, everywhere we look, there is corruption. There's chaos. The whole world is enslaved because of sinful and foolish humanity. And so Paul says, like a woman groaning, giving birth to a baby, the creation is personified. It cries out. So Paul writes, even the deepest and most intimate testimony of the Father's Spirit in you today, the comforting Spirit of God, even that moment of the deepest comfort that we have felt in our lives, your highest moment of the present assurance of God's presence, think of this, even that moment isn't even worth comparing. It's not even worth comparing to the future hope. So the world is crazy, but even in your greatest high, it can't compare to the future hope. Verse 23, and not only the creation, it's not only out there, but we ourselves have the first fruits of the Spirit, and we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. But for who, hoped, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This, Christian... And we'll unpack this even more next week. What does it mean to enact this prayer of Abba Father, this external and this internal groaning that is our inheritance right now? What does it mean to do that in the life of the gathered church? That's what we'll reflect on more deeply next week. But this isn't a contradiction. It's not a contradiction to say, that we're saved out of slavery into the household of the Father, and the way that is manifest is suffering. It's suffering. This is not a contradiction. This is our inheritance. It might be perplexing to us, and it is to us. It's greatly perplexing to us day in and out, but this is God's purpose for us. We have received the spirit of adoption as sons, we have received a guarantee of this inheritance, of this inheritance, past tense, and this is given to us, it's titled to us in our baptism. So we have received this, and at the same time, Paul says in verse 24, in this groaning creation and in our groanful sinful bodies, we are eagerly and patiently awaiting adoption. We have received adoption as sons by the Spirit, and at the same time, we are waiting for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies, the fullness to be completed. Just as Christ the Son entered into the waters of baptism at the beginning of his ministry, at the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then he entered into suffering and death, and he toiled with fruitless and faithless disciples. He died and then he was resurrected to life and glory. This is the pattern of the gospel. We too are adopted by the spirit of the living Christ in baptism, out of slavery and baptized and guaranteed an inheritance in Christ through baptism. And what does that lead to? Does it lead to partying all the time or freedom? No, it's, it leads to a life in the Son of God, as sons and daughters of God, which is to say, a life in this broken world, in our broken homes, in our broken church, that is 
not grumbled in, but all of our groanings and all of our sufferings, even the moments when we want to cry out to God, show up, Dad. A life of patience by the Spirit, even with groaning and through suffering. And then, and then after this, after death, resurrection. This is our hope that is out before us, that is being accomplished even now by the Spirit. Our bodies will be redeemed. Our adoption as sons will be complete. Christians are conformed to the image of Christ, crucified. And this is our hope. This is our inheritance in the household of God. And then we can hope to bear the image of Christ one day when he returns. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.